The Future History of Energy and Transportation Documenting the paradigm shift from the era of oil and internal combustion, to the era of robotics By Julian Cox Narrated by the author with the aid of an artificial intelligence Chapter 21 A Story of Ice and Fire Much of the discussion of hydrogen thus far will be common knowledge to many readers and yet a nagging question remains. Why is hydrogen still being pursued by very smart people who ought to know better? Why are some of the best and brightest minds on earth and many billions of dollars in capital from widely respected corporations such as Toyota, as well as senior politicians including presidents of respected nations, most notably Japan, still dedicated to pursuing hydrogen both technologically and ardently in terms of propaganda, including setting out to theme the Japan 2021 Olympics as a Japanese hydrogen economy promotion on the world stage? See Volkswagen Clean Diesel Emissions Test Cheating Scandal for the standard of conduct that should be anticipated from a widely respected corporation, grappling with promoting a hydrocarbon refinery product as clean. Recall the chemical formula we touched on above. CH4, plus 2H2O, equals 4H2, plus CO2. Methane and water steam, becomes hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Watch this. CH4.H2O. Nominally in the proportions, CH4, 4, H2O, 23. This is methane hydrate otherwise known as fire ice. From an illustration. Fire ice, balls of methane hydrate are set alight as part of a demonstration by Japanese scientists. The country scientists have become the first to work out how to extract pure gas from the substance found under the sea. Methane hydrate is the world's most abundant known hydrocarbon. It is a methane and water admixture that lies under silts on the seabed as well as to be found under ice sheets and permafrost. It also happens to be the substance that most terrifies genuine climate researchers when contemplating runaway climate change, because receding ice sheets stand to expose vast quantities of this material to disturbance, resulting in methane plumes with at least 70 times the global warming potential of CO2 per molecule. Known deposits of methane hydrates are significantly more massive and abundant than all known reserves of classic fossil fuels combined, and Japan has identified what it estimates to be a 100-year supply of methane in this form, in its territorial waters. This is a quantity of methane sufficient to transform Japan, until recently the world's second-largest economy, from the world's largest importer of natural gas and one of the world's major oil importers, with no traditional fossil fuel reserves of its own into a resurgent energy-independent hydrocarbon-based superpower. The only even half-feasible way of getting methane from this source to the surface under any kind of control, is by attempting to maintain the integrity of the methane hydrate admixture at low temperatures and under high pressure, so that what comes out of the drill rig and is piped on shore, is methane and water. Then the options are expending energy and process steps drying the methane to make pipeline natural gas. Alternatively, to use the water and methane together as feedstock for steam methane reforming, SMR. Then instead of water and methane the output is hydrogen and CO2. That's the plan and the ultimate why of hydrogen. This is the reference to energy for the next 100 years in Toyota Mirai marketing materials. Methane hydrates is the other natural resources Toyota is referring to as a source of hydrogen, after listing out misdirection about plants, biomass, renewable electricity and the abundance of elemental hydrogen in the universe. Methane hydrates are the decomposition gases of animals and plants congealed into a semi-solid material that lies under the seabed at cold temperatures and very high pressures. They are covered by loose silts composed primarily of calcium carbonate, comprising the shells and carapaces of plankton, mollusks and crustaceans, the bones of fish and sea mammals, intermixed with estuary silts that are also part biological part mineral and finally the mineral silts produced by waves and tides. This is the first stage of fossilization of an offshore oil and gas field under limestone and marks the continual carbon burial process that defines a living planet as alive, for life like us. Nature has arranged it in this way for our dead to stay buried and to rest in peace. They are not intended to be exhumed and burned so that their shimmering ghosts can hang in the air to torment the living. The Permian extinction coincided with a 12 degree Celsius increase in average global temperatures. The Permian, Triassic extinction, was probably the closest call with total extinction since life on Earth began. Although apparently sufficient sea life endured this event to form a coral reef, 
now known as the Texas Guadalupe Mountains, such was the height of sea above land, and to fill the Texas Permian Basin with methane hydrates, which over the intervening millions of years became the Texas Permian Basin Oil Reserve. This extinction has been attributed not to CO2 but to the clathrate gun, a massive release of CH4 from clathrate formations containing methane hydrates. Given that the Jurassic extinction appears to correspond to a meteor strike that is now the Gulf of Mexico, it is reasonable to suppose that meteor hit a methane hydrate formation. Humans were not around to be blamed for either event and can instead, perhaps thank them for human existence, when without them, an advanced civilization according to a Darwinian model might well have developed some millions of years sooner and from some other branch of the tree of life altogether, and thus closed us out. If Earth is anything to go by, a living planet has an energetic atmosphere and a dead one does not. It is not normal to be able to set fire to anything on the surface of a planet, let alone to encounter a 21% oxygen atmosphere that permits breathing. Over enough time without living plants and algae, anything that might eventually burn or rust, even if it is deep underground, will combine with an oxygen atmosphere until all of the oxygen is gone and anything even remotely combustible is an oxide. On a dead planet the atmosphere is marked by either little or no atmosphere or the atmosphere is composed almost 100% of the final end products of oxidation, including chlorination and so on. Typically CO2 or SO2 and its chemical species. Looking for the light spectrum of an energetic atmosphere such as the blue Rayleigh scattering of oxygen and discounting planets with only exhaust products for an atmosphere, is a key tool in the constant search for life elsewhere besides here. If we found another pale blue dot in the morning of a distant star then we would know for certain that we are not alone. If we found such a dot with a blue ring atmosphere and went on to detect a number of our industrial pollutants, then we would know we had company that might well be curious about us. So to the point of disturbing methane hydrate formations without the aid of a meteor. The trouble with giant methane hydrate formations that are continually and gently settling in what are known as clathrates, lying under prefossilization silts on the seabed, is that they are extremely unstable and have a tendency to concentrate at the edge of undersea continental shelves. Both the sediments and the methane hydrate materials themselves are unstable. Disturbing the silts and clathrate formations with deep-sea drilling and dredging equipment comes part and parcel with a virtual guarantee of creating undersea fissures and landslides, at risk of releasing gigatons of dislodged material over the edge of a continental shelf. Methane is approximately as happy to bond with water as any other hydrocarbon, such as those that make up gasoline, in other words unless the water is in a vapor state, or in this case cold and compressed, methane is apt to be waterproof. At the slightest provocation methane will separate from the methane hydrate admixture into plumes of gaseous methane, plus fresh water, water that has an osmotic affinity for salt. Plus methane hydrates are buoyant in water and in most situations, excepting vast Antarctic deposits under ice, methane hydrates are to be found within a few hundred meters of the sediment surface. If one changes the temperature, the pressure or disturbs the surroundings, one gets a cascade gigaton methane plume unless one is impossibly careful. Horizontal drilling and fracking charges do not fit the description of careful enough. Neither is pumping gaseous CO2 or warm water into a deposit with a view to forcing methane or fire ice slush out. A single gigaton undersea methane plume resulting from the pursuit of a hydrogen economy, assuming a short-term GHG equivalence for CH4 of 72 times that of CO2, means that an industrial accident of this nature will immediately result in the tripling of the global warming potential of the world's total human-related annual GHG emissions, rendering the sum of all efforts at human GHG emissions reduction completely futile, for decades at a minimum, and there is no reason to suppose only a single gigaton plume is in prospect for this utter folly. If the year following such an accident and the year after and so on we were to enact an emergency response of producing nothing by way of CO2, it would have no net effect on the direction of GHG-related climate change. Hoping that global warming on account of atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations was a complete hoax all along, would be the only hope on this score that remained. There is plenty of reason to be skeptical of computer model projections relating to the timing, extent, economic impact and even the long-term direction of climate change and every reason to be skeptical of climate change politics that seek to relocate instead of reduce global emissions, for example to maximize foreign demand for US dollar-denominated currency or to go in search of cheap labor. Nevertheless, there is even less evidence, none, 
and no reason for confidence whatsoever to conclude that rapidly accumulating unnatural concentrations of greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere is a good idea. Especially methane. While we are on track to evolve from dependency on internal combustion technology with respect to CO2, exiting the fossil fuel era with a legacy overburden of CH4 in the atmosphere would narrow the options for coming generations quite unreasonably. Options like a deliberate nuclear winter or perhaps flying a giant sunshade out to keep station at the Lagrangian point between the Earth and the Sun, would remain on the table if runaway global warming did in fact commence and escape human control by means of emissions reductions in a civilized manner, in pursuit of something more economically attractive, namely renewable electrification and robotics. The security we have regards greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is derived from the fact that human controllable CO2 emissions are determinative of the direction of an annual increase or decrease in atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Equilibrium with the natural carbon sink resides at a point around 40% of current human emissions. Below that, we are able to expose the natural carbon sink as the dominant effect on our atmosphere. This remains true except in the case of only risking an overwhelming greenhouse gas event herein described. That level of control will expire if we do something as monumentally daft as risking gigaton methane plumes in the pursuit of a hydrogen economy under the patently false flag of doing so to help the environment. Meritless risk-taking and closing down species survival options under a cloak of willful public deception is clearly not okay. A gigaton methane plume is the likely outcome of one smallish undersea landslide and this is the most likely to occur while fumbling on the bottom of the ocean with immature methane hydrate extraction technology, and Japan among others has already commenced fumbling in 2016 under the cover of intensely disingenuous green propaganda, with the complicity of fracking and industrial gas interests in Europe and the USA, in relation to the funding of universities and industry to pursue both extraction technology and fuel cells. The USA in particular, has not thought this through clearly, because the very first casualty of Japanese methane hydrate extraction, even if it could come to fruition at scale without mishap, is the loss of the world's largest single export market for US natural gas. Additionally, if there was genuinely the confluence of an energy and emissions crisis, where the only realistic option was to power the US road fleet with methane derived from US shales, than the optimum technology to balance vehicle performance and automotive production capacity, practically beyond all reasonable doubt, is turbo CNG as a range extender in a hybrid architecture with regenerative braking. The proven results of turbo CNG vehicles, trounce FCVs on every metric, especially emissions but obviously materials handling as well. The obstacle? Environmental initiatives such as CARB that penalize the exhaust pipe and ignore the comparatively enormous, and economically immutable, well-to-wheel emissions from the SMR production of hydrogen. Regardless of opinion concerning the importance or otherwise of CO2 reduction and whether or not CO2 or CH4 is sufficient to drive climate in adverse ways, CARB rules, thanks to a carve-out created for hydrogen on behalf of what is effectively a fossil fuel lobby, seek to force a counterproductive outcome by its own internal logic. Moving emissions from the road to increased emissions from an SMR station next to the road. This is clearly meritless on any basis. How could there be any merit in something this futile? Hydrogen is definitely not a promising member of an all of the above solution to global GHG emissions reduction and methane is definitely no bridge fuel. Unless global emissions are of no consequence, this is a destination fuel if public deceit of this nature were to hold sway over outcomes. Tackling arguably man-made climate change is one thing. Tackling unquestionably man-made deceit on this scale ought to be a simple matter of pointing it out. Ultimately the same solution to fossil fuels generally also applies to hydrogen, unassailable competition from cheaper and better options. Already the case for electric vehicles as opposed to FCVs is essentially settled. The all-electric Tesla Model Y is on course to outsell the Toyota Corolla globally amidst negligible to zero organic market demand for the Toyota Mirai FCV and similar and while hydrogen trucking promoter Nikola Motors has all but collapsed into scandal amidst criminal charges for scheming to defraud its investors. Nevertheless, the case for renewable power generation versus methane, and in this case its derivative, hydrogen, is not as yet. Hence at the time of writing, the quest to exploit methane hydrates continues. However, hydrogen is more amenable to public refutation than conventional fuels. The issue at stake here is not whether anthropogenic global warming is real. 
The issue is global emissions exacerbation sold to the public and to public representatives on the blatantly false premise that hydrogen is part of the solution rather than a most pressing part of the problem. Hydrogen is driven by an unholy alliance of fossil fuel interests and climate change politics, pushed by financiers, and impacting the highest levels of governments at the state, national, federal and international level. The honest case for hydrogen, namely the possibility to achieve methane-based energy independence for Japan and South Korea in particular, is not the case being made for it. Instead, pushing hydrocarbons as green by means of public deception is. This is an implicit admission by its backers, that it cannot be sold honestly to a public whose acceptance is deemed vital, while making a complete mockery of initiatives like the Paris Agreement, which, as should come as no surprise, Saudi Arabia is delighted to ratify. Note. A climate accord that Saudi Arabia is willing to ratify, instead of protesting as an act of economic warfare targeting the core of its national interest, is clearly deserving of the uppermost zenith of suspicion. A cursory glance under the hood of the Paris Agreement reveals so-called green bonds available to fund the exploitation of methane hydrates, and methane more generally in the form of natural gas. If it can be said that the greater good is to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and sustainable transportation, then by simple corollary the greatest threat of a significant misstep, is hydrogen. Unlike oil upon which currently most people genuinely depend, even to attend an environmental protest, a situation that only the availability of competitive modern emissions free choices can and will solve, methane hydrates, SMR and hydrogen fuel cells, are just a profound mistake in the making. Nobody going about their daily life will miss them, only polluting industry for which this is their last lifeline and last line of defense against emissions-free electrification. This is something that can be halted by public awareness, precisely because the multi-hundred billion dollar lobbying and media campaign for it, rests precariously on the ability of monolithic global polluters to deceive an audience of Greenpeace members and similar to cheer on public officials and media figures, recruited to promote hydrogen as if it were green thereby empowering this very same grassroots group to stand up to the fossil fuel industry and say no. Consider that for the global launch of the Toyota Mirai, Toyota committed a total of precisely 13 assembly line workers in Osaka to produce it, and its customers. Most notably, and probably close to exclusively, hydrogen lobbyists themselves, and their counterparts in government bureaucracy. This is called stage props for the media, produced with a combination of automaker PR budgets and taxpayers' money. Consider also, Toyota's commitment to California's hydrogen infrastructure to serve its promotional FCV fleet. At the time of writing this consisted of a loan to First Element Fuels Incorporated, a primarily on-site SMR-based hydrogen fueling station developer, headed by a former GM marketing executive and also the leading UC Berkeley scientific advisor to California's state legislature, also formerly of GM also the author of California's so-called Hydrogen Roadmap. This is a loan to be repaid undoubtedly from the future receipt of government funds, that the aforementioned advisor was empowered, via his seat on the California Fuel Cell Partnership, a fossil fuel, industrial gas and auto OEM lobby group, whose members include Toyota, and to whom California has delegated management of its hydrogen infrastructure disbursements, in order to self-deal public funds to his own private company, First Element Fuels Incorporated and duly does so. This exercise in cynical profiteering from public concern for the environment bordering on racketeering, which for the avoidance of doubt fully defines the role of hydrogen in public environmental policy, cannot conceivably represent a publicly supportable approach to the global environment, with upwards of hundreds of billions of dollars of public money. A very good suggestion might be to protest, loudly, the International Olympic Committee regards Japan 2021 and Toyota's sponsorship of the IOC through 2024, to call the IOC to account for the dire irresponsibility of sullying the Olympic brand by association. Japan 2021 is the most profound subversion of the Olympic movement since 1936. That was just painting life under German National Socialism in a positive light, not promoting death by global extinction, for the children. The key risk here, is not that methane hydrates or hydrogen has a strong chance of market success but rather that early efforts at disturbing methane hydrates, carries with it an unwarranted and outsized risk for all of humankind on the eve of far more attractive and sensible options, even for Japan. Hydrogen also poses a gross and corrupting distraction to cogent public policy, 
resulting in the diversion of significant public funds in the name of emissions reduction to hindering the same, and to divide auto industry response to emissions standards requirements, between sense and nonsense. Hence it is imperative to ensure that market adoption of renewables and of electrification and transportation advances at sufficient pace to head off the threat of a hydrogen economy before it takes root. Electrification of transport would appear to be progressing at sufficient pace to halt the threat of hydrogen adoption in vehicles, thanks entirely to the leadership role of Tesla and its key partner Panasonic, but there is much urgent work to do with regards to solar, smart grids and grid storage to head off the risk of methane hydrate-derived hydrogen pervading power generation.